study session of April 4th, um, beginning with citizens' comment on agenda items. Do we have anyone signed up? Boy. We have several. I'm going to go ahead and call your names. Bob mm, Brazel? Brazel. Like Razzle, Basil, Bob Razzle Dazzle, Brazel. Please do. Well, I didn't uh, prepare any remarks for this evening, but I saw on the, in the, uh, I think the Gazette, that uh, your uh, 38th Avenue study thing, whatever you've been doing, trying to make everybody think they're important, conducting your, your uh, cut and paste kindergarten classes for 100000 that you've now got two proposals that you seem you want to go with on three lanes and all that. And, but... Uh, both of them, according to that, will require that the road be changed on the width, which was voted against by the public. So I certainly hope that if you decide to do this, you're going to have this voted on by the public, and also how you're going to finance it. But if you're going to go against the public's wishes on a vote on the street width then, uh, and try and pull some fast loose game here that uh, that we, you know, we had a whole new study and this is a whole new proposal. It looks the same to me as it did before. So you should be cautious about going against the public will because the next vote may be uh, removing some of you. Thank you. Thank you. Dina Svetlick. Could I ask that um, the people that come up to speak, if you could say your name and spell your last name and give your address? No, that's all right. Uh, Good evening. Dina Zvetlik, 3715 Newland, S-W-E-T-L-I-K. I'm here this evening to show my support for transforming a short half-mile stretch of 38th Avenue or just over 10% of the four and three quarter mile avenue that traverses the heart of the city into a vibrant main street. Just over 10% of one street. Looking more broadly by my calculations, this half mile of main street comprises about 5% of all commercial corridors identified in the city's comprehensive plan. The percentage would be even lower if considering all existing commercial frontage. I've invested in Wheat Ridge by buying and maintaining private realm real estate, my home. I am asking the city to invest in its real estate, the public realm, or the public streets that it owns. This real estate owned by the city must be invested in to leverage a greater return for the community and to remain competitive on the front range. Streetscape improvements that result in increased activity or customers ultimately provide an increase in critical sales tax to the city. A former mayor of Wheat Ridge stated, in context of Wheat Ridge staying competitive, quote, to me, it's a matter of continually improving your city, continually changing, and I simply think that uh, what we're going to see in 20 years or 30 years or 50 years are going to be great changes in these cities because we have to progress with these changes or we can't make it, unquote. I agree that the city of Wheat Ridge needs to progress. Sometimes we need to be reminded of looking at the forest from the trees. It is time to invest in the public realm, the real estate of the city along 38th Avenue, to provide adequate multimodal access and safety, to create great places for people to gather, to remain competitive in Metro Denver, 
and ultimately to ensure that a true heart for the community exists for today and into the future. Thank you. And the quote was from Mayor, former Mayor Hank Stites uh, at a forum that he was in in 2010. Thank you. Ruth Baranovsky. Baranovsky. I think I'm going to ask him to sign up phonetically. My name is Ruth Baranowski, and I'm at 10430 West 47th Place. And I'm actually. Could you spell your last name? Oh, Baranowski. B A R A N O W S K I. Thank you. I'm actually here to make a comment about Prospect Park. Um, I'm actually very excited that the park is going to have improvements. This is, this is a park that needs it. I'm just concerned with the amount of asphalt and concrete that is proposed right now. Um, there's still conservation efforts going along the whole creek to improve the waterways to make sure that they are not polluted and with this amount of asphalt it's I'm not sure but it seems right now as the <coughs> land stands to be getting rid of some essential landscape and I would just like the council and the city employees to make sure that they are really understanding the impact that removing these trees or landscape could have on the waterways not just of the lake but of the creek because too much Asphalt and too much concrete can add to algae pollution. And honestly, we need more trees along the river instead of more driveways. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Smith. It's off of being short, I'll tell you. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I live at 4255 Parfit Street. My husband and I also own property on Pearson that abuts the area that's going to be where the, uh, the football field is going to go. So we have some interest in this area. I would somewhat echo what the last speaker said, and that is that I think we do need to pay attention to the amount of asphalt that we're putting down. And if we are putting down asphalt, I understand I'm going to, what I'm concerned about specifically is the area, God, I don't have a pointer, but it's the area south and east of the new driveway that is going to provide improved access to the parking lot. Mouse, yay. Okay. Okay, this is where there's going to be a new roadway probably needed. I can, I've been around here, I can understand that. My concern is about this area in here. Right now it's being shown in what I think is bluegrass. Okay. I don't know if it's bluegrass or not. Currently, it's native trees. Some of them are, some of them are, are, are uh, Siberian elms, but there's, it's more of a natural, wild looking area. And I would certainly propose both as a, a water quality issue for buffering the water that's going to come off of here. Also a maintenance issue that instead of bluegrass in this area between the bike path and the driveway, that we have native plants and shrubs in there. Also, this area along the bikeway needs some buffer visually and even and maybe for safety issues, bigger plantings like trees, native grass and shrubs, skunk bush, there's a lot of different things that can be planted in here. But I, I would propose against bluegrass in this area. Again, for uh, aesthetics and a buffer between the cars coming in and out and the bike path, for better use of water. Um, our water is coming right now from the Willette Ditch. It's also coming from our lakes. But I'm on the Willette Ditch board, and I know that the state or the water powers that be are going to start metering how much water we're taking out of Clear Creek. So I think that's something the city of Wheat Ridge wants to pay attention to. Um, and look for areas where we cannot put in bluegrass. 
Um, and also, the, I think the a larger plan, the more native plans, is are going to provide more of a filter as that runoff water comes off. Just take a look at my notes and make sure I got this. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Kim Calamino. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Kim Calamino, 4070 Dover Street, here in Wheat Ridge. I encourage Council to follow through and support the outcomes of Create Your 38 process. I encourage you to work together to find a way to move forward collaboratively and support of the strong voices that you've heard through this process. As you consider the very strong participation in the Create, Pro Create 38 process, please consider the fact that many more citizens than ever before have participated in this inclusive and well-conducted process. We have a new and multi-voiced process, the outcomes of which deserve to be respected by review and consideration by council and finding a way to carry forward the visions that have been suggested to you by your citizens through their process and participation. I personally, as did the majority of participants in Create Your 38, support the vision of a three-lane main street. I know that this is a divisive issue, but I encourage you to look at the statistics, the research, and the reasons that the citizens support a three-lane option. We can have new businesses attracted. We can have a place for gathering. We can create an environment that encourages walking, biking, driving safely, and creates a vibrant environment. Uh, those are important things to our economy as well as to the quality of life for our citizens. And we also have to recognize it's time to invest in ourselves. It's time for the city and our citizens to demonstrate our leadership in valuing our community and investing in our community. It's going to require probably a, an initiative that I won't even venture what it might sound like, but it's time that we invest. It's time that council come together on how we might invest in ourselves, and I encourage you to work together to find the way to move forward in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Ann Brinkman. Ann Brinkman, 7420 West 34th Avenue, Wheat Ridge, District 1. Um, thank you for taking my comments. I'm just here to quickly encourage you to, to continue forward with the Create 38th process, and I have two points. First, regarding any public vote, if it were the same exact uh, ballot wording, which I hope it is not, and you've learned your lesson from that, um, we as a democ democracy do this all the time. Um, we both locally and nationally bring up votes both through legislative votes and through ballot initiatives uh, when we hope that uh, situations have changed. I can give you, you you probably already know all the different examples. <clears throat> so don't be deterred by threats. We do this all the time. We do, do it by the state. We do it nationally. You've heard it all the time. Sometimes you roll your eyes, but it happens all the time. Um, secondly, related to um, when situations change, the demographics, demographics in Wheat Ridge are changing, and they're changing rapidly. I urge you to get on the right side of history and support a fully implemented Main Street not another partial or half-assed implementation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I don't have anyone else listed. Let's go on and move on to our regular agenda, unless there's some changes. Okay, let's start with staff reports. Uh, I don't know if we have any other than the, the specific. Is there any other staff reports? No staff reports tonight, thanks. Okay, then let's go on to our main, which is um, Joyce Manwaring. Thank you. Um, I want to 
give you a little bit of background um, regarding how we got to this um, renovation plan. So in um, April of 2015, um, the city adopted a new Parks and Recreation Master Plan which recommended renovation of Prospect Park. Uh, it was then budgeted in 2015 and we started the design process. That process included hiring Carol Henry from Designscapes um, and she worked together with her staff and our staff to begin the process of coming up with this plan. We then held one public meeting um, to show the draft of the plan and it was revised um, somewhat um, with comments um, included in the revised plan. And then the Park and Recreation Commission uh, met in March and they saw this plan and recommended it to City Council for approval. So we have completed um, all of the new development of all the park sites that the city owns and the master plan indicates that we're meeting the needs of our residents in terms of the, the amount of park land we have. So the next step is really to start renovating some of our older parks to meet the needs of how residents like to use parks today and um, continue just to update the infrastructure which we do continually anyway annually with with specific projects and specific parks. But this park in particular has really not had any major renovation or update probably for 35 to 40 years. Um, Anderson Park is probably the next one on our list. But we'll get started tonight with Prospect Park and I wanna introduce Carol Henry. She's gonna walk you through the changes in the plan or really the plan itself and then we can answer any questions. Concepts. Uh, Joyce has said we have uh, worked with, with her staff and taken comments from public and the uh, Parks Commission on improvements to Prospect Park. Um, and I guess I'll address the, the area that has, has generated some public uh, conversation first just to, to walk through that. Um, currently the road into the South Pavilion uh, comes along the, the lake and uh, what we found was there, there are a number of uh, issues as you round the corner with the speed of vehicular traffic, uh, bicycles and pedestrians. So uh, something that was suggested was, was adding a, a new en vehicular entry here, closing this off for, to only uh, bicycles, pedestrians and fire access, uh, and then adding a, a separated trail down in this area. And, and I'm sorry for any confusion on the graphic. The, the area between the road and the, the uh, trail is meant as a, as a native plantings and something that would be very appropriate for the area. We're, we're not in any way saying that that should be bluegrass. That would be a, a waste of uh, resources to, to make that bluegrass. So um, uh, we are, the, currently the uh, shelter that's down in that area is is aging and in poor repair and is also right up adjacent in basically into the parking lot so we've taken the location from this area which is next to the restroom moved it more into this this grassy area has taken it slightly away from the parking lot and then tried to, to form a nicer area that has the shelter playgrounds uh, basketball and uh, Horses. Horses. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, to, because right right now it's it's a bit uh, scattered along the way. So if you're if you're using the pavilion, um, it's it's not as much of a place to go as is simply a pavilion. So we we're trying to create a, a nicer user space. Uh, we're suggesting adding a uh, a small bridge connection. Because there's some lovely play and grass area areas over here, but they're really a bit dangerous to get to trying to get through the parking lot. Um, we have also suggested reconfiguring this uh, greenway entry exit trailhead so that to make it a little bit safer as well. There are a number of areas that aren't very pedestrian friendly uh, and could be safer and so that, that's a, a bit of what we, what we addressed. Uh, I think one of the things that really began the process was that with the acquisition of the Lovejoy property. We have put in a new football field uh, on that area we have provided a slightly reconfigured trail and some buffer between the, the uh, 
play field and the trail as long as, as, as well as some uh, vegetation. Um, and so with allowing this piece to be football, because currently now this is ball fields that are also shared football, uh, we're able to improve the existing uh, ball fields, uh, fix some of the drainage problems, add some permanent fencing, and, uh, and really address some of the, the ADA issues. Right now there's, the dugouts are old, they're, they're not accessible, the, the uh, grandstands are behind are also not particularly accessible. Uh, we've given a, a nice pathway that links the parking over in this area down to the trail and over to the, uh, the football field area. Uh, and I think would also give a little safer access down to the, the trail because right now the, the, uh, the parking and the, the drive lane are really right up against the fields. We've, we've carved out a little bit of a sidewalk for it, but it's any, uh, any pedestrian traffic we could get off of that area is, is a benefit. Um, we have, we're showing replacing the existing restrooms. Again, they're, they're aging and they're not accessible with, with new restrooms and new storage. Uh, so that the, uh, the youth groups that use that will have a, a good storage area. There'll be an improved storage for the, the park staff and restrooms that are accessible. Um, the, we're leaving the Lovejoy property in place, but we're suggesting putting a small play event by there and some uh, shelter act activities. To the verb, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Uh, to make that a really nicer area of the park. Uh, and with that, we'd like to suggest bringing a, a, a two lanes of traffic in instead of one, uh, one small shared lane of traffic into the site. The, uh, the uh, way the, the park is seen from the road, it, it's hard to see. There's a tennis court right here that really blocks view into the access to the, to the, uh, to the park. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to remove the, the tennis court and add uh, pickleball courts. There's been a huge, huge uh, support for adding pickleball and some social shelters next to that, um, as well as improving some of the landscaping up in this area. And additionally, we have, we're actually showing, making the asphalt smaller in these areas. You, we're not, we haven't reduced any parking, but the, the parking lots themselves are about 20 foot wider than they need to be. So if we can, if we can cut back on the asphalt a bit, keep the same parking, that then allows us to have a, a nicer area developed along the, the, the whole uh, lakefront area. Because right now the asphalt comes really to the edge of it, so we can, we can put in a, a shade shelter, we can put in some nice signage that leads you to the trail around this side of the, the park, because it's, you really can't tell that it's there. So really improving that northern edge of the, the pond. Uh, and then adding some, some uh, pedestrian ways along here as well as a dedicated sidewalk along here so that right now there's a social trail on the west side of the, uh, the site. So making that a, a real trail and then, and then providing more, more sidewalks and more controlled vehicular access because it's, right now the, the, it feels like the cars really have the right of way for the, for, the, for the site and we would like to balance that out a little bit more. Again, losing no, losing no parking, uh, but making it a little, little safer. We've got irrigation improvements and some drainage improvements on the ball fields as well. That's, uh, did I miss anything, Joyce? Oh. Is it time, can we ask some questions? Yeah. Um, Council Member Fitzgerald. All right. <clears throat> Do you have grandstands planned for the ball fields? as is, but we're, we're providing better paving around them and a little better uh, vehicular control. Uh, they're, they're a bit difficult to get to right now if you have any uh, uh, access issues. So. Mr. Matthews. Uh, two questions. One is just a comment. Um, I just did over there yesterday, and as 44th Avenue gets uh, busier and busier, which it's going to do. I notice you've got some shrubbery there, and I don't know what it is, but it shows casting a shadow. But it would be awfully nice if you would maintain left-right sight distance. 
as you're trying to pull out onto 44th because I, I felt cramped there yesterday and with the traffic on 44th increasing, it's, that's just going to get worse. So keep a little bit of that in mind. And I'm just curious, it had occurred to me also, do, who uses the football fields and do we get any revenue off of any of the little leagues or whatever? Do they kind of help, help us maintain that? I just never thought of it before this came up. Oh, Wheat Ridge Midget Football, Little League parent organization uses the football field. And yes, we charge a per player fee, uh, around $10 per player per season. I'm not expecting them to carry it. I just was curious. I, I mean, it's a good thing. I'm not. Yeah. Right now, the football field just overlays on the outfield of the baseball fields. So it's difficult to rotate, rotate the fields and offer the kind of quality turf we'd like to offer to, to both groups. Okay, thank you. Ms. Gwynn. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about some of the playgrounds. So the playground that's shown in the new area, it's just been moved a little bit west, correct? Correct. It's, a, it's the same equipment. It, it is just moved a little more centrally into the, uh, the, west. the nice grassed area that surrounds it. So we're not losing a playground? No. Okay, so the playground further west that's kind of not really in the plan, that one's just going to stay there, that playground? Yes. Over, over in this area. Right, that playground just stays there. So we are not losing any playgrounds? No, we're just improving the access to it a little bit. Okay. And then how many parking spaces are we increasing or are we? We're maintaining are we, what we have. We're maintaining? We're the asphalt a bit in the northern, northern areas, but the, it, it's still a standard parking, parking area. Okay. Okay, those are my questions. And Joyce, isn't the, the new, the playground further to the west is, is new that we replaced that last year, is that correct? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, that's correct. Uh, other questions? Ms. Duran? You mentioned in your presentation um, and included the Burbert House in there. Is that still something we need to discuss? I mean, I'm interested in, in keeping that if we can and verifying the cost of how much that would be and what it says here. Well, right now we don't have any specific plans for the Burbard House other than showing that we would like to keep it. Mm -hmm. um, it is in need of renovation. So the concept for the Burbard House at this time is to move the little leagues out of the basement storage area mm -hmm. um, into the new restroom structure, which would have storage connect mm -hmm. built onto the restroom structure. Mm -hmm. So they would each have a bay garage bay that they can back up to and have more convenient, safer storage. Mm -hmm. And then we will need to price out and renovate the Burbert House. So the concept um, that I will be presenting when we get to that point in the design is for it to be a one room event center of some mm -hmm. type that could be rented uh, for meetings or events. And then it have a patio or shelter area adjacent to the house. Okay. So that's, that's really all I have right now, but we know it is in need of extensive renovation. Okay, and then you would come back with the estimation of cost? Yes. On what, that, what it would entail? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as it relates to the public safety and the, the way that this park is sort of policed, is there any discussion relative to how these improvements will help or hurt or otherwise uh, help us improve the security of the park or are there any issues around that? You know, there really aren't because it really, for the most part, flows and functions um, the same. I can't think of any real, real issues um, related to security. We do feel like moving the playground away from where it is right now creates a safer situation with the playground away from the trail, if you remember, um, you know, it's, it's pretty close and fairly close to the creek. Um, I know we had a discussion about that at one point, so, but not from a security police standpoint do I see anything different. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a good point, Zach. We'll, we'll have, before final design and construction, we'll have the PD kind of review it to give us any uh, hints about where things are placed and such. Lighting and otherwise. Yeah, yep. Making sure that's taken care of. Thank you. Councilmember Davis. 
So I just have a quick question um, from about the restroom. I'm surprised you said that was dated because I think it's a nice restroom. Um, but is it, you know, the restroom as it is now, you can kind of see it from the path. So will you still be able to see it from the path? I mean, from like, if you were running on the path that you could see that there's a restroom right there, or is it kind of back more? It, um, it, we may be talking about two different restrooms. Mm. Okay. We are talking, the one we're wanting to renovate or to build a new one is over by the- Okay, uh, so the, the other one's we're staying there. The other one I was gonna say, cause that's nice. Yes. Okay. I do have a question uh, in regard to the football field. Uh, is there any, or, or does it need it, any kind of a grandstand and cars and parking for that? Where would they go? They are to park in the park and walk on the new pathway over oh, to the field. Mm -hmm. And between. generally with football, um, there isn't really room for them. Right. And they don't generally use it. They tend to stand or bring chairs, sit on the sidelines. And we needed to create also a little warm-up practice to the east side so the fields actually moved a bit west to create okay. that space. Okay, I see. Yeah, there. Show a, a small bleacher on, on this side for anyone who would need to, to sit. Yeah. But there, there's a, a, a lot of room around the field for informal seating and standing. Because of the type of play that goes on there that's appropriate. Okay. Any other questions from council? Or it's a gorgeous plan. Thank you for the presentation. I'm excited about it. Um, so we need to do some work here. So next steps are um, we're asking for approval or consensus of the plan as you see it today. And then we can get started on design development or design concepts, a contract for that. And then that would be ready for construction later in this year or later in the fall. And then as we go through that process, having a plan and a, and a budgeted amount and a plan that shows what we're going to do allows me to look for uh, some possible grants uh, to help us fund the renovation. But this is a phased project um, due to the funding required to complete all the items. Larry has a question. I have a feeling it's about how are we going to pay for it. No? Uh, <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Come on, Larry, um, get there. I'm, I'm a little curious. Uh, the uh, lake down to the west where the herons and everybody nest out in that island, those trees look like they're about to fall down. And my question was, it's really a neat attraction. And, and everyone likes to go, and I see guys out there with binoculars. Is there anything that we should in, or have included in this plan that might do something to help that nesting area and maintain it in perpetuity? Because, I mean, maybe the trees, you know, I can't tell because I'm 200 feet away from the island, but it just looks like we've got less trees there than we, what I remember we used to have, less nesting space, and it looks like they're getting ready to collapse. Now, maybe, if, has anyone looked at it? I'm sure the staff is aware of, um, of the condition of the trees, but I'll have to um, ask them if they are planning on I mean, I just, plant in case one falls down, do they have one ready to go that's replacement? I, I can't, I'll have to get back to I you about it. I hate to lose that nesting spot. Yeah. I'm just, that's a real neat place. I'll have to check and get you an answer. Joyce, maybe you can explain how, as we've built the other parks, how we've done it in increments, et cetera, so that for the people listening and well as ourselves know how we do it. Okay, um, we use um, Fund 32, our, the city's attributable share of the Jefferson County Open Space Tax. Uh, we call it the Open Space Fund. And then any conservation trust fund dollars that might be available to put towards a project. So that's where the funding comes from for park uh, development or park redevelopment. And then there are grants available from Great Outdoors Colorado as well as Jefferson County Open Space. And so we will apply for those grants to um, help augment the funding that we have available. So for example, Discovery Park was built in two phases over three years of funding with several different grants plus our own funds. So it's just a matter of accumulating it, deciding which phases of the development work the best. Carol and her firm um, 
was our designer on Discovery Park, and they're very good at, at getting that phasing done. Um, and that's how we'll, we'll plan to fund it, but it will take several years, in fact, probably four to five years in order to get enough funding to complete the project. Thank you. And thank you, Carol, too. Um, we do need to have a, um, uh, eventually we're going to have to approve the master plan, so I need a signal from you that, that a consent. I would like to suggest a consensus that we uh, uh, approve this plan. All in favor? Okay. Thank you for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a presentation by, oh well, well, Mark and Lauren. No, no, no. We're going to move to Preston. I got my items mixed up here. Okay, Mr. Gibson. Mr. Preston. Preston. What's his last name? I left my notes. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Preston Gibson. I'm an area manager with XL Energy. My address is 5460 West 60th Avenue, Arvada. I appreciate your time this evening. I am, by the way, um, the liaison between the company and the community and vice versa. If you have questions, issues, or concerns, or want to know more about our programs and so on, I'm the connection to the company and we also occasionally come out and uh, bring information to you on new initiatives new programs and so on and so forth so that's what i'm here doing tonight i have a quick 11 slide uh, powerpoint presentation on an initiative that we're calling as a company our energy future and i'm going to follow that up with some quick information on um, the number of customers that we have um, in Wheat Ridge, as well as some statistical information on some sales and use taxes we, we, we pay here, as well as franchise fees, so on and so forth. I'm also going to address some of the um, recent improvements that we've done um, in the city to improve reliability. So hopefully you'll find that of, uh, the, of interest. This particular program is a new, new initiative of our company. Um, essentially, you know, over the last um, number of years, we've uh, reduced um, our carbon emissions here. In fact, a lot of times I think we, um, as, as, as a citizen or a citizenry, think about you know, how can we reduce carbon emissions. We as a company have actually done that. We've reduced, if you compare 2005 carbon emissions to the emissions that we have today, they've been reduced by about 25%. Um, and uh, we expect that to be in the mid-30s by the time we get uh, 30 percent renewables on our system by 2020. Currently, we have about 22 percent renewables, and we have been uh, replacing, uh, in this region, we've been replacing our coal-fired generation, power generation, with natural gas, and of course then adding renewables in terms mostly of wind, uh, some solar. But if you look at the Cherokee power plant, which is about 64th in York, if you know that big, the big stacks that are to the east of uh, the freeway there, we have um, uh, uh, eliminated three of the four um, coal-fired generation facilities. Uh, we put in over 500 million in the last couple of years in terms of building a new gas turbine to, to gener generate electricity. We've only got one coal-fired um, facility left there and it's gonna be uh, refueled from coal to natural gas next year. So we've been doing things like that as well as adding lots of wind turbine systems. So I think in many ways as a company we're saying, you know, what's next? Where do we go from here? We do have a very good environmental record, including being number one in wind, number one wind energy utility in the entire country for the last 11 years uh, running. We're one of the top 10 in terms of solar capacity as well. So we have been a leader and continue to add, you know, wind to our system. In fact, um, on October 2nd last year, you might find it interesting that more than half of the 
electricity that was generated and used that entire day uh, was actually generated by wind, which is, uh, I think we've actually set some national records in terms of, of, of that. So again, the question is, is uh, essentially where do we go, where do we go from here? Um, so I think that what I'd like to impart is that we want to create options for our customers. Customer empowerment is what we'd like to say is key, what's very, very important to us. Um, and creating new ways that customers can participate in new technology, new technological options, whether they be smart meters or um, uh, you know, purchasing um, solar uh, through um, XL Energy, solar energy, um, battery storage for solar energy, and so on and so forth. We've got a number of programs how we're moving forward with options and ways to uh, really move us into the, uh, what I'd say, the 21st century and more interactive options uh, with an efficient grid system. Um, so let's move on to uh, the next, uh, next slide. And we like to say that, uh, you know, there's three key points there, powering technology, powering the economy, empowering customer uh, choice, as I just mentioned. Powering the economy is very important, of course, with um, many companies, many individuals, many uh, customers really wanting more options for renewable energy, and um, I think that can certainly help with business retention and uh, business um, attraction uh, that I know Steve Art is so good at doing here in this, in this city. Um, in terms of uh, some of the particulars, some of the details, we have recently filed with the Public Utilities Commission what we call a gas rate case. In other words, this is an application. We report to the Public Utilities Commission as a regulated monopoly, and we've asked them to allow us as a company to joint venture with companies that are in this industry of uh, providing gas, providing, you know, drilling for natural gas, providing gas, and, um, and allowing us to participate in purchasing in advance gas reserves because gas is at a very low price, as you probably know. It's it near historic lows over the last 10, 15 years. And if we are able to then invest in um, those gas reserves, we essentially pass that cost, we pass that low cost on to our customers. And in fact, today, um, if gas prices, commodity prices rise, we pass those costs on. If they lower, then we lower our prices. And we do that, I believe, on a quarterly basis. It's, uh, it's gas cost adjustment is what we typically call it. But if we can actually invest in gas reserves, we think that we can keep prices lower for our customers over a long period of, of time. Um, the next slide, I think this is some of the most innovative uh, work that we're currently doing. And we call it our innovative clean technology uh, projects. We filed for approval of our innovative clean technology projects with the Public Utilities Commission late last year. And I'm pleased to say that they um, have recently approved that we move forward with these projects. And essentially, it's two battery demonstration projects. And uh, we're combining solar with energy storage. And the interesting thing is that, you know, sometimes we wonder, you know, we see the light, obviously, sun shining during the day. And we always hear about battery storage. And as a company, we have been doing battery storage research uh, for years out at the uh, Solar Te uh, Technology Acceleration Center out in Aurora. We also do research hand-in-hand hand hand with National Renewable Energy Laboratory and National Center for Atmospheric we Research in terms of wind forecasting. We've got wind forecasting down to, I think, 10 or 15 minute increments. So we can, if, if wind, if we predict wind's gonna be blowing, we, we sort of tail back a little bit on our generation of electricity with natural gas so we can um, use a wind uh, to, to generate that electricity. But at any rate, these are really, I think, pretty innovative programs. And the first program is the Panasonic program where we would install a single large battery system on a, on a commercial customer's feeder where we also plan to install large, a large photovoltaic you know, solar system. And we're working hand in hand with Panasonic. It's, they're building a new large, uh, a building out uh, by DIA, and it's going to be in partnership with DIA, the land developer LC Fullenwider, Widener, 
no, full and wider, excuse me, and then city and county of Denver. So it's a, it's a partnership where we're actually doing this and it'll enable us to um, uh, also build a microgrid, sort of a microgrid electric system. And uh, when the solar, the sun is shining, we'll be able to, if it's, the energy's not completely used, we'll be able to store it. And then, then it can be used later when it's, uh, when it's needed and the, the sun may not be shining. We also have a project out in Stapleton where we'd install a series of batteries um, on a feeder that um, has a lot of solar currently on it. And I, it, it, we've, we've for, for uh, until you know, in the last 10 years, we've mostly sent electricity one way on a feeder. It comes from our power generation facilities and goes out to our customers. Now our customers are sending it back, which is, which is fine, but sometimes we can't accept all of that energy, all of those electrons on the line. So we need a way to store them. So we, if we can store them with batteries and then release those electrons when they're needed, that will um, help uh, balance our system a lot better than it, than it currently is today. So we're looking at those kinds of projects. We're looking at a modern grid, as I mentioned. Um, the, uh, the grid at the uh, Panasonic facility will be um, a, a microgrid, a modern grid. And also we are going to be, um, if approved by the Public Utilities Commission, using smart meters. We're gonna have um, 10,000 or so smart meters introduced into our system over the next year or two, and then we'll continue to add smart meters in our system that allow you to be able to better understand you know, what devices are using um, energy in your homes and in your businesses, and then be able to um, you know, um, cut that, cut, if, you, if, you, if they're, they're using too much, or if you don't need them to use that energy, you can cut, cut that energy back, cut, it, cut that energy usage back and it enables us to monitor the two-way system and for you to be involved as customers in a two-way system. Um, this is something, the LED street lights, a program that we had approved last year by the Public Utilities Commission. So uh, we've had some discussions with your city. I'm not exactly sure where we are with those, but at, at any rate, we uh, um, have a program where we can uh, uh, actually take the high pressure sodium lights that you see currently on your main roads, the, the cobra heads as we typically call them, and we'll come out and replace those with new LED lighting technology, new LED lights at no cost to the city. One program has no cost. And then you'll have a savings of about five to 7%. So you get brand new modern technology, more energy efficient, and it will be um, a lower cost to the city to, uh, for that lighting. And there's another program where you'd actually pay for the, the uh, fixtures and the installation of the fixtures and you'd save more over time. But, uh, but at any rate, um, it's, I think most of the cities are taking advantage of, as we call it, option A, which is we come out and we certainly install those for uh, free uh, to the city and uh, recoup that over time, that investment. And Preston, just to uh, give council an update on that, we did um, move forward with option A. I think we gave council an update and a manager's update, and um, I think you've already got it scheduled for a couple months out. Um, we got an email a while back, so several more, I think several months, I think they'll be starting in Wheat Ridge, so. I think that's ter terrific because you're uh, one of the first cities. I mean, th we do have a number of cities, but being one of the first cities to come online and I express that means that you'll get your lights changed more quickly. The cities that came on come online later, it may be three years or more when they get their lights changed. So that's that's great news. Uh, the phase two rate case is uh, has been uh, submitted, and essentially this allows us for, to um, use more interactive technology, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, it'll break down uh, the prices of what you pay as a customer so you can more transparently see the cost you're paying for energy, the cost you're paying for the grid, the cost you're paying for demand side management, all the different costs on your bill so you'd be, it'll be very transparent. We also um, will have costs in there for re relocating and removing street lights, uh, for street light banner attachments. We've had an agreement situation in the past. I know you've entered into an agreement with us. Um, if this is approved by the Public Utilities Commission, there's going to be no more agreements allowed. There's going to be no more liability insurance allowed. It's going to be much, more, much, much simpler than it has been. This is one of the programs that I, th I think is very interesting. We are proposing a Solar Connect program where we'd actually build, and we are currently building a solar on our system, but we dedicate a 50 megawatt, which is a pretty large uh, uh, power facility. Um, and uh, then if you as a customer said, look, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't want solar panels on my roof. I've got big trees. I don't want to cut them down there. You know, I, I can't. I'm leasing a home. If, it's a, if a business says, look, 
you know, our bedrock values are renewable energy, but I'm just leasing a building or I can't put the panels on. How can I get there? Well, this will be a way that they can get there, that you can get there. We don't have all the details worked out, but it would cost a little increment more, and then you would be able to say, because it would be true, that you're getting all of your energy generated by solar panels. Um, I think that's going to be a very popular program if that's approved by the Public Utilities Commission. We're not doing away with our existing programs. We're continuing to fund the existing programs if customers do want panels on their rooftops. So at any rate, I think that uh, that could also certainly be used to um, attract business. So in conclusion, you know, I think you can see that we've got a comprehensive plan to move forward to uh, what we call our energy future. Um, I think this is uh, really the next phase of customer empowerment, bringing more renewables, more options onto our system. And uh, we're very pleased to um, have the opportunity to, uh, to tell you about it. Let me um, hand out um, some quick information that I wanted to go over that's more specific just to Wheat Ridge. I have some here. And just a, just a minute on this, and a minute, and another another minute or two. But this uh, this handout that you're going to see as it's going around is called "Our Commitment to Wheat Ridge," and we put this information together on an annual basis. And we uh, typically, if you have time to meet with us at uh, Colorado Municipal League, I don't know if you participate in that. I can't remember if we've met before, but. But at any rate, this is information from the calendar year 2014. We don't have 2015 as of yet compiled, but just, just some information I thought you might find interesting. Uh, number of electric uh, customers, residential customers, we have 14,422 in Wheat Ridge. Businesses, just over 2,500 businesses, uh, electric customers. We have 11,383 gas customers, uh, residential gas customers, and we have 1,849 business customers. You can see that uh, just below uh, to the left, generating revenue, uh, we have a franchise agreement here with the city, and that franchise agreement requires that we pay 3% of the gross revenues that we collect um, through your, through th from the customers in Wheat Ridge to the city, and it's called, it's called franchise fees. So annually, at least last, uh, in 2014, we paid a little over $1.3 million to the city in terms of franchise fees, and we also pay uh, taxes our sales and use taxes over that calendar year were about 1.2 million for a total of about 2.6 million, which is, uh, I guess, a little over $200,000 a month. We, um, we also uh, support uh, local businesses. We spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars, close to a billion dollars, I believe, in supporting our Colorado businesses with the work that we do and the work that we need to have done. And just in Wheat Ridge alone, we spent uh, $3.4 million with um, suppliers that, uh, that we work with. Uh, our workforce in Colorado, we have about 3,750 people that are employed in Colorado. We also give to, we have a focus grant program we give to charities, uh, Family Tree, um, Redistribution Center, I'm not actually sure what that one is, but Wheat Ridge Foundation, we've given on a regular basis to, to many, uh, many uh, organizations in Wheat Ridge, and we also give a lot to United Way. We're, last year we were ranked as the number one corporate giver in Colorado. The next page shows um, energy efficiency programs. We have um, uh, energy efficiency programs, demand side management sometimes they're called, and we paid 112,000 in rebates in 2014, overall 3.5 million. If you look to the right in terms of clean energy, we, um, we have uh, 470 uh, premises on wind, wind source, and uh, 180 solar reward systems, that's the distributed energy, you know, solar panels on rooftops program. Um, with wind source, I forgot to mention that we just, we're just lowering the price of that. We just filed a renewable energy standard plan to lower the price from, I think it was over $2 for 100 kilowatt hours per block of 100 kilowatt hours, and now it's gonna go down to a dollar and a half if that's approved by the Public Utilities Commission. So. I just, just some information I thought you might, might like to see. And the final thing I wanted to just say is a little bit on some of the improvements we've done here in Wheat Ridge, then I'll, then I'll be, uh, be quiet and answer questions if you have any. In 2014, we did a rebuild of a lot of our wiring, our electric wiring in the area that's um, west of Wadsworth between 38th and 44th Avenues. We'd monitored and seen that we'd had 
a number of outages in that area, so we went in and replaced the cables, the wiring, and other equipment in that area. Um, we also, um, uh, in, in the area of, uh, again, 44th and 38th to the east side of Wadsworth, we've put in some new uh, modern equipment that we call, uh, it's more of a smart grid technology, sectionalizers is what we often call it. So if there are any outages in that area, they will be um, limited to smaller numbers of customers and they automatically, they work automatically. And then within typically, most typically an outage, we have our teams that go out and respond to those. Typically within an hour or so, hour to two hours, outages are repaired, but this will limit the number of customers that are impacted on outages. We um, have replaced some equipment. We've re rebuilt some wiring, put new wiring in on Teller Street south of 38th, and we've looped that over to the uh, west side of Wadsworth. I think there's an apartment complex that we uh, connected in there. We also do uh, have a pole replacement program. We replace transformers when they're needed. We monitor outages when there are a number of outages on a particular segment of cable. We schedule that to be replaced. We Overall, we have a half a dozen or more programs that uh, address everything from overhead cables to underhead power lines to transformers and poles and so on. And I uh, just wanted to say, I, I know you probably experienced some outages with our snowstorm that we had. I can't remember when that was. When was that? Was that a week ago? Last Wednesday? Just, it seems anyway, how quickly we forget how long ago that was. But I, I can tell you that we had, um, we had about 900 linemen here. We had them coming in from other states as far away as Texas. We couldn't actually, we couldn't even get some of them here because the roads were closed. We had the freeways that were closed. They're, they're sitting there waiting for the freeways to open, but we had all of our employees that could do the work, all the contractors that could do the work. Everybody, we had mutual aids, we had other utilities helping that weren't experiencing the issue. But we, we got about 90% of our customers up in 24 hours and uh, Close, you know, close to 100%, maybe 98% within 48 hours. And we had a lot of just single customer outages that we, we had to go back and take care of. But it was a, it was a brutal storm with the winds ahead of the snow and the wet, heavy snow. It was, uh, it, we had over 300. That was the most amount of customers we've had out just because of the uh, uh, unique atmospheric conditions. But, but at any rate, we, we worked really hard to, uh, to get, get those customers back up. And I hope that you didn't experience uh, too many outages here. So anyway, I think I've rambled long enough, so I'll be available for any questions. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Do we have some questions? Sounds like you were too complete. Mr. Matthews? Nope. A gazillion questions, but this isn't the venue. I could, I could ask him questions until tomorrow morning. <laughs> but we throw both of you off. Thank you very much. I appreciate the information. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think um, I'm excited about that you do look further and further into the future and, and prepare for it, and um, that's, that's what we want. That's great. And thank you for that. We actually, believe it or not, look 30 years in advance in terms of forecasting customer wow. demand and build all our programs 30. around a 30-year program. So, okay. Thank you again for visiting us. We can move on to our item number four, which is um, create your 38 process update. Patrick, Ken, Scott. Yeah, we got. The, we actually have the, the whole team here in case there's any questions. But I think Mark Westberg has a um, present short presentation. Um, he's going to give just give an update on um, the process to date and um, what final steps are in place to uh, before we bring it back to council for some um, final decision making. So with that, we'll um, start with Mark. So I have half the number of slides that pressed today. I only have like six slides. So um, this will go really quick. We're just going to mostly recap what was in the memo that we that was included in your packet this evening. Um, so just a recap of meetings one and 1 1.5. Uh, meeting one was so successful we had to schedule 1.5. And then we also had an online survey after that. And, and all of that together, we had almost a thousand people involved. In, in voting and, and involved in just being there. We had around a little over 300 people at both meetings, and then we had nearly 700 people online that, that uh, responded back on that survey. Uh, one of the questions we asked them was, what are the core values of the participants? And, and both the online and the, 
the folks at the meetings were very consistent in that regard. Safety was number one and economic success was number two of the people there that were really concerned about safety and they were really concerned about 38th Avenue being successful economically. So we thought those were both really good things. We had 33 participant generated designs. So the, the, the folks divided up in tables and, and they generated designs. 73% of all the designs that were presented were, had three lanes. Um, we had one design with two lanes and then, and then I think eight designs with four lanes. Um, when we ranked those based on the, the, the preferences that people had for those, two thirds of those designs either had the two or the three lanes. The, the, the two lane design scored number 10 and then, and then the, the rest of those top 21 or so designs were all, were all three lane designs. And only, only the three lanes designs overall had greater than 50% support. So what we took from that first ser series of meetings was that the preference of the participants was to move forward with three lanes because of that reason. So we, we took that information and charged into meeting two, and we had a little over 100 people, I think maybe 120 people at that meeting, and we, we built actually a life-size model. It wasn't a scaled-down version. It was a life-size model of the street on the wall behind the, the speaker. Um, and on that, we were mostly talking about everything but the lanes of traffic. It was everything else, the, the sidewalks, the mini zones, the bike lanes, and the parking. Those were all the things that were showing up in the, the designs that the participants had. The sidewalks, what we got, what we landed on was 66% of the people, so two-thirds of the people that were there said they wanted eight-foot wide sidewalks, and we had 12% that actually wanted wider than that, and then the rest was, was divided among the, the other wits we had. Then in many zones, we had 59% preferred four feet wide, and then 31% preferred wider. So we had almost 90% of the participants wanted many zones that were at least four feet wide. The bike lanes, um, even though they scored fairly well early in that, that evening process, as we worked our way through the evening, the final vote on those was 64% of the people said they didn't want bike lanes on the corridor in preference of, of the other things that were available. And then um, parking was 68% preferred to have parking where it was possible. So as the corridor gets wider in places and different things happen, if we can squeeze some parking in while still keeping the sidewalks and maze zones at those minimums, then people were interested in adding some of that parking in there. We talked about implementation then, mostly whether we reconstruct the road or retrofit the road or get right away and those kind of things. And 71% of the people preferred the two options that stayed within the existing right of way, basically not going outside the existing right of way. Uh, but there was no consensus between that reconstruct and retrofit at that meeting. The score was 36 and 35. So it was pretty much a split vote on that. So we, we decided to spend meeting three mostly talking about that option. We had about 50 people, a little over 50 people at that meeting. And in talking with the consultant, it's pretty typical that as you go through this process, the meeting size tends to shrink. So they weren't really surprised that that, that happened in this case. The reconstruct package, package which was priced out at about around seven and a half to $10 million, had the eight foot sidewalks and the four foot mini zones. And then we also presented the retrofit package, which was between four and a half and, and just under $7 million, um, would keep the existing five foot sidewalks and would add amenity zones in there in the space that's available. And so um, often you end up with wider amenity zones. So again, this wasn't quite in line with what the, the came out of the first series of meetings, which was eight foot sidewalks and four foot amenity zones. We wanted to offer this up as a, a lower cost option. Um, and, then, and then of course, Patrick talked quite a bit about potential financing options and things like that. When all was said and done, of, of those 50 or so people that, that were there, about 70% of them preferred the reconstruct package. I think they just decided that that they just would rather rebuild the entire street rather than, than try, to, try to just do a retrofit kind of option. So that was really the outcome of meeting number three is where we, we landed on that. So our next steps, we're having an open house on April 27th. Um, we're advertising that in all of our, our normal ways, um, social media and online and, and those kind of things and, and talking about it here tonight. We also announced that at meeting number three. We announced that we were going to have this open house on April 27th. We're not going to have any presentations. It's just going to be really just we're going to have sort of sections of the ballroom set up with, with a summary of the, what happened at meeting one, what happened at meeting two, what happened at meeting three, really what the process was, what the results were, uh, a lot of the same information that was in the memo that we, we sent to you to this evening. And then we're going to present that participant preferred design, that eight-foot sidewalk, four-foot amenity zone, full reconstruction of the street. We'll have that on tables uh, that, that will, be, will have the whole corridor laid out on what things will sort of look like. And then we'll have some, some different images and stuff to try to really get people a feel for, what, for what's there. And we're going to have the opportunity for people to provide comments. We'll do the, the, the really low-tech version of sticky notes, where people can write their comments on a sticky note and stick it right on the plan, right where they are interested in having that done. We have found that to be really successful at meetings. We just go back later and take pictures of everything with our phones and, 
and a great way of recording what people's comments are. Just in case people aren't comfortable sticking a note down where other people are going to see them doing it, we will have sort of a much more anonymous comment box that people can fill things out and throw it in there. So if, if people want to be anonymous with their comments, they can be. Um, and so we're going to have that. And then we're also going to set up an online thing on, on SurveyMonkey, similar to what we've done before, that will just be the, uh, basically all the same information that's in the meeting where people can scroll through things and provide comments um, in an online format for folks that can't come to the meeting. So we're trying to allow, again, sort of like we did with that first round of stuff, another chance for just absolutely everyone that wants to chime in, give them all a chance to chime in on, on where we landed in the process and, and where things are. So that's our plan for the April 27th meeting. And then our hope is once we get all that information in, we'll come back to you on May 16th or at some later date if we decide we need a little bit more time. But right now we're, we're looking at May 16th to present the various options of how this could be implemented. Um, based on, again, all the comments that come in from, from, the, from this last open house meeting that we're having. And then our, our big thing will be then to request direction on where do we go from here. Um, here's where we've landed and here's what all the comments were and, and where do we go from here and how do we implement what the participants in, in this whole process have said they want and, and so that kind of thing. So that's really all we've got as far as the thing tonight except to answer any questions that you all may have um, concerning, concerning the process and the results and sort of where we've landed. So. That was, that was, he's, he's lightning fast, really, yeah. Council, it's your turn. Do I have any questions? Ms. Duran. Can I uh, just reconfirm, I, I had asked Patrick, that encompasses from Upham to Marshall, not the whole stretch of Wadsworth to Harlan, correct? We, had, we started the whole process actually for Wadsworth to Sheridan because we've mm -hmm. got three lanes striped through the whole process. So, so once sort of after meeting one, then we sort of started focusing in on Wadsworth to Harlan um, as where we're looking at things. And the, the, the plans that consultants put together actually do cover from Wadsworth to Harlan. The costs that were shared at, at meeting number three were from Wadsworth to Harlan. Now, certainly as part of our ongoing implementation, we can mm -hmm. bite off pieces and parts of this. We don't have to do the entire thing all at once. We can focus in on more of that downtown Main Street area, which is the is the, the Upham to Marshall and even, even a smaller segment of Upham to Pierce, if you will. So, so certainly as we look forward towards implementation, we can do that. We wanted to go ahead and involve the public globally, though, in the entire street corridor that, that was involved in the original study. So, so Wadsworth to Harlan yeah. would encompass that 9.75? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks for asking that one. <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald. I just want to rec reconfirm something. Uh, Going back to meeting number one, the we had 300 uh, people at the meetings. Um, my memory is that the survey ruled out duplication. Isn't that correct? That uh, people could not vote twice, and if they attended the meeting, they could not vote online. Isn't that true? Yeah, so we actually gave the opportunity for the folks at meeting one to vote on meeting two designs. During meeting two, we went ahead and voted on all the meeting one designs. So that was a fairly long session with them. And then with the online stuff, we asked for names and addresses, and I think phone numbers and email addresses or something. And then, and then our staff, mostly um, our, our PIO folks and, and some of the folks in administrative services, went through all that stuff for that came in on SurveyMonkey and, and made sure that there were no duplications. Now, someone could have lied, certainly, and, and said they were somebody else, but, but we made a really conscious effort of trying to make sure that we were getting you know, one person, one vote kind of a situation so that people couldn't double up on things. Other, Mr. Urban. Thank you. Um, as this uh, particular process was built on the Wazir PEL process, what types of steps were taken to engage the business owners relative to these particular plans, or how, how was that process engaged as it was done during the PEL? So from what happened at the t when the, the consultant was first introduced to the town hall meeting until January, um, city staff was not really involved at all in this process. It was, it was all the consultant going out to meet with business owners and um, different, different kind of groups and different organizations to try to get a pulse on it. I know that, that we, we provided, you know, that make sure you talk to all of these people. They've been very engaged in the process up to this point, so we made sure that they went out and met with those folks that they could. Um, I don't know that Kristen went walking down the street and knocked on all the doors, but we got pretty close to that kind of level of involvement. And certainly when we have done mailings and stuff, when we did the connections mailing uh, or the mailing with the postcards inviting folks to the meeting, we did that with using our connections address list, which is everybody in town. So um, we certainly tried to involve all those folks as much as we possibly could. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Matthews. 
I, I got I to gotta say this, and I'll try and make it short. Um, over 300 and over the 30th Avenue, I've had a raft of emails come in uh, for people trying to be anti-300 and pro-creature 38. And I just have a couple of sticking points, and I just want to make, and I've returned emails to everyone that's written to me, but just for all the people out there, I want to know exactly where I stand and why I stand that way. I've heard a lot of funky civics notions that I sort of missed when I was in high school. And one was that if only 40% of a people vote for a citizen initiative, then only 40% of the council have, you know, 40% of the council doesn't have to support it. And I'm not sure when that became the rule of the land. I don't understand that. Um, we are a nation of laws in a democratic process that says majority rules. And we vote on something, be it by one vote or a thousand votes, by 10% or 50% majority rules. And once that majority has voted, then that's the rule of the land and the will of 100% of the people. Uh, and that's where I have, that's where I stand. And, I'm, and I've heard another, another uh, theory that the 2B vote doesn't count because it was back in November of 20, you know, a year and a half ago. And I looked and I researched and I did my best to find out where there was an expiration date on that vote or a use by date. And I can't find one. So personally, I'm not for or against three or four lanes, but I am absolutely for a majority vote of the people. And I cannot support anything here unless we move forward with a citizen initiative or a referendum to put this back out to the people. Because 58% said they did not want to narrow the street, and here we are with options to narrow the street. And I keep hearing, well, that doesn't, their, their vote doesn't count because that was back in 2014 or 2015 or wherever. There is no expiration date. So if we put this on the street, and put it out to a vote of all the people, not 300 people, excuse me, Tim, not, not 800 people, but all 17 or 18 or 20,000 people that voted on 2B. And a majority says, this is what we want to do. I'll, I'll work overtime to make it happen. But in the meantime, that's my job, is to bring the will of the majority of the people into this room. And they voted no on narrowing the street in 2B. And that's my position. And I've responded that way to everybody that's emailed me, and I'll be willing to debate it and discuss it forever. But last time I checked, help, help me out here. If there's an expiration date on that vote, I'd be happy to find it. Thank you. Actually, since it's in the charter, I think no matter what, we, the, 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 all the steps have to be followed. So it's really, it, that should be handled. Mr. Ann. What I'd like to add to Larry's comments is, I support putting this to the vote of the city, all our citizens to vote on it, but not just to vote. What I'd like to make sure that's in there is the cost, how we're going to fund it, the width determined by the citizens, and the design. Is, is it plan A? Just whatever the design's going to be so that it's all specified, so that there aren't any questions, aren't any issues after election day. Did folks understand? Did they not? And whatever the will of the people you know, is determined on November 5th or whatever date that is, that's how we go and that's what I'm willing to do. But I really think we're, we're at a place now where all of us feel, you know what, let's do it right this time. Let's reach out, let's let the community decide, the majority decide what they want. And whatever the will is, is, is what it'll be. And I think we just all just kind of want to put this to rest and, and get it done. So that's what I would ask support of in a ballot question. Yeah. Uh, did I have somebody else? Go ahead, Mr. Urban. Um, I would just like to make sure that uh, as it sort of as this, as we're looking at this question on the ballot, that it be sort of segregated to this specific issue that uh, as it relates to any kind of sales tax increase. I, I don't want to see a situation where we're sort of lumping this particular project with something else and making it some kind of package deal. I think it really needs to sort of stand on its own legs. And if it is brought to a vote that is sort of a, a either a yay or a nay, and, and so that we have some very clear direction, but it be segregated to this specific issue without any sort of add-ons or a, 
uh, at the state legislature, they might call that a sort of a Christmas tree where we sort of add on different projects. We're gonna do this, this, and this. I wanna make sure that it's very specific to this given issue so we don't sort of have sort of mission creep, so to speak, that you know, people know exactly what they're voting on. Other comments or questions? No? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. You can go home and watch the basketball game. Surely you'd... You... <laughs> You're going to get us out, out of your early mayor, so we can go home and watch the basketball game. Um, well, let's see, i got to find something else here to keep you here for a while. <laughs> okay. Elected officials reports, do we have anything tonight? I'll get, I'll get the screen. Makes a lot of noise. Mr. Urban, anything from CML? Nothing to report tonight, thank you. Okay. I'll go to Mr. Fitzgerald. <laughs> Nothing to report. <laughs> no, thank you. No, no tables? Okay. You've been awfully quiet tonight. <laughs> She's over there. You, your voice work? Genevieve's hogging the microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And Ms. Ms. Durant. I do have something, and I'll pass this around. The Grange is going to have an event on, let's see here. It is on April 21st, and it's going to be before Mother's Day. They're kind of... Uh, working on this together with Alpine Nursery. So let me pass these around. If you could RSVP, all the information's here, but it, the event is on April 21st from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and it is family orient orientated, so please bring uh, your kids in RSVP by, let's see here, I think it's April 19th. And you can RSVP to dom, D-O-M dot E, dot Brenton, B-R-E-T-O-N, at gmail.com. And let's just start this way. Let me grab one for him and give to Janelle. There you go. One other comment, too, separate from that. Can I do two? <laughs> okay, thanks. On Wednesday, May 25th, uh, the Wheat Ridge Fire Department is going to have a town hall meeting. It's going to be at the Wheat Ridge Grange starting at 6.30, just to kind of answer questions regarding uh, the merge with West Metro and any thoughts or concerns you have. Thank you. I'm done. Well, I might as well ask my city clerk there. Nope. He's rattling his fingers. I think he's ready to get out of here. Oh, no. I'm, I'm here for the evening. I don't have anything speci specific. Um, so I believe we can call it, call it closed.